The Rwando Podcast is an exploration of the unconscious and the game of life. Be sure to visit Rwando.com to get a preview chapter of my upcoming book, Infinite Play, and free access to my content library. Enjoy the show. What's up, folks? Today's episode is on the long-awaited magician archetype. If you're in the Mask and Underground group, I, you'll know I, I posted a poll. It must have been almost two months ago of what is the next episode you want me to focus on or the next topic you want me to cover. And an overwhelming, uh, the overwhelming response was to focus on the Magician Archetype, to do the Magician Archetype episode. And uh, it's taken me a long time, I admit. But one of the reasons why it's taken me so long is that um, I had to make some decisions of how to speak about this. Because the Magician Archetype, if, if you don't know what we're talking about, I am taking the term from uh, Gillette and Moore's book, King, Warrior, and Magician, Lover. We're not going to focus on their lens of the magician so much, but essentially, the magician archetype is the part of your psyche responsible for creati- creativity, self-expression, uh, meaning-making, the narrative of your, of your life, spirituality, and heightening, summoning, integrating this part of your psyche, this part of your unconscious will aid you in these elements of your life. Creativity, self-expression, meaning-making, but also the spirituality piece. And this is what, before I really dug into this, I had to make a decision. Because on the one hand, I can speak about the magician from a very grounded, life-hacky perspective of like, oh yeah, that's magic stuff, It's, uh, it's a metaphor for creativity. And in many ways, that's very accurate. Like if you look at many of the, um, mythological tales of magicians, Merlin, shamans, supernatural forces, almost all of that can be used as a metaphor for some some emotional experience, some element of the hero's journey that you experience in your life, even though the events are obviously not the same. But there's also another way to look at the magician archetype, or another way to look at magic with quotes on it, which is the more spiritual side, uh, the less grounded side of like, manifestation and this is where people who are into the law of attraction spend a lot of their brain power and stuff and I was hesitant because if you listen to the podcast you know I try to focus on what is practical even though I do go deep into philosophy I try to stay I try to stay grounded right I spent a lot of time in spiritual uh, spiritual communities there's danger in, in becoming that untethered from from material reality however as is one of the Uh, main points that we will get into in cultivating your creative potential that is high fidelity truth and for me to really be honest and vulnerable I do have to admit there are a a fair number of magical beliefs that I hold right in in more grounded language there are some unprovable things that I believe to be true and I would be lying if I pretended I didn't believe they were true so I, I'm going to try to speak to both lenses. So if you're if you're someone who like magic is only useful to you as a metaphor, magic with quotes around it, please take everything I'm saying. We are going to talk about certain elements of occultism, um, drawing from like Aleister Crowley's work uh, and Peter Carroll, uh, one of his books, Liber Null. I'm going to actually quote a few times here. If, if all of that stuff seems like hocus pocus, please just translate it into metaphor. Everything we're going to speak about in terms of quote unquote manifestation, which I actually hate as a term rather call it something else, but making your intentions come true uh, can be translated into the creative process. However, if you are into that spiritual stuff, f- please feel free to take it a little bit more literally. However, um, my word of warning to everyone is when you're trying on a belief that can't be proved, just remember it's an unprovable belief. It doesn't mean it's not useful, but it's, uh, you know, a lot of people have gone mad and insane and gone deep into uh, delusion by taking certain unprovable things a little too seriously. So, with that, we're gonna jump in. This is The Magician Archetype. Roll those, roll the intro music. All right. So, with every episode, I'd like to start with a story. And this is another thing where I had a lot of options. I, you know, I've been working on this history show, the History of Men series, and I had some, some good examples. Um, I had a story with Genghis Khan. One of his first battles were won uh, because he brought his shamans, uh, you know, the Mongols were um, an animist, animist uh, people. And he brought his shamans, his enemy brought their shamans, and like somehow a thunderstorm uh, came about right in the beginning of it, and, um, and everyone believed that the, the gods were on the side of uh, Genghis Khan's shamans. So the other side panicked and routed, and, and that was it. And like, that this was, 
something that was a magical belief, a perception that caused a real change in reality. Uh, I had some other stories similar to that, like Crazy Horse is a historical character I really believe in. You know, he had a vision that he would never um, ever be harmed in battle, and that's exactly what happened. He was actually killed by one of his own people. But actually, and actually there's many, there's many war stories uh, where, where magic or magical thinking has had a real effect on, um, on, the, on the tide of events. Um, I, I could list a few others, but I actually wanted to start with a story that I've already told um, because it's actually the most meaningful to me and actually highlights most of the principles that I want to zone in on uh, here. So I told part of the story already in the Lover Archetype episode of how I've how I met the love of my life or how I've connected with the love of my life. But I didn't highlight certain elements of the story that are more magician, right? So essentially, I mean, I, I told the, the, the details in the lover archetype, but essentially uh, my girlfriend and I, we've known each other for years. We kind of knew, we met kind of in passing and then we're, we went into different continents and never, uh, it just never seemed like we would necessarily meet again, but we were connected on social media. And for years, for years, every time I would see her on social media, uh, I would think, man, it'd be great to be with a woman like that, right? I didn't think I, I want to be with her. Because I, I wasn't attached to her. I was attached to the, not even attached, I, I just felt desire for the idea of her. And, um, and actually, I found out later, she had a similar thing. Like when we would briefly interact on social media, it was fairly platonic, it was fairly uh, PG. Um, but she had the same feeling of like, man, I would love to be with a guy like me. And there's something about this lack of attachment that, you know, as we fast forward through the experience of where we actually like professed our attraction to each other, this is back in September. Nowadays, we look at it now, I mean, six months later, we look at it and it's like something about the fact that we really felt this desire, but it was not attached. It was like, it's like to use the law of attraction language, it's like we said it and then forget it. And somehow, um, over the course of the, the events, like we connected during the, the height of COVID, somehow, with, even with the world making it so hard to travel and like so many roadblocks, we had all of these synchronicities, which are synchronicities being, uh, in Jung's terminology, a matching of your internal experience, your external experience, in a way that um, seems unlikely. We had all these synchronicities with travel specifically where she was able to get here. There's a two week window where someone can fly from where she was at to where I was at. You know, she had to fly through Peru to Holland to here. And there's literally only a two week window where this was possible because right after, right beforehand, everything was shut down. Right afterwards, everything was shut down. Like she actually got in right in the perfect moment. And it's, even though it could be coincidence, looking at this from a purely um, rational perspective, there's something, I mean, it's hard, it's almost impossible to not think like, man, this was like divinely inspired. Like, like it's so unlikely that the timing would work out so perfectly. Obviously, this is subjective meaning, important point. But there's something that is, it's impossible for the two of us to not see this as something magical or divine or predestined or something, right? Now, I want to highlight to you, dear listener, this probably means nothing, right? You might think, oh, that's cool, but like, it doesn't have a meaning to you. Meaning is subjective, and that's something critically important to understand as far as, as far as playing with magic, with quotes around it. This was actually the most subjectively meaningful outcome, because as I spoke about in the lover archetype, like this desire I've had my entire life since boyhood was to be really with someone I really love. In fact, if I look at all of my, like, my adventures in relationships and dating and sexuality and intimacy, they kind of, I mean, I can look back now and string a clear narrative, a hero's journey of finding now the love of my life. But the final point I want to bring with this, because we're going to hit on all of these points throughout this episode, is, well, one, the first moment we saw each other, like when she got out of quarantine and we met in my hotel room, we embraced, we kissed, it was, it was this amazing moment. And at the same moment, we both said, wow, you're real. And that... Feel, and we laughed, of course, and it was funny that we said the same thing at the same time. But that kind of enchantment, that enchantment feeling, that is the crux of what we're going to be referring to as magic. Whether you're going from the grounded lens of like the creative process, the, the artist way, to perhaps something more spiritual of conjuring certain events in reality. Uh, in both ways, it's true. And the final bit is this entire relationship, probably because of all these synchronicities and all these things that happened has allowed 
we both have this experience and we use this term a lot with each other that like our relationship feels like home. Like it feels like returning home, coming back to something familiar, even though we've only recently connected in this way. <clears throat> so I tell this story. There's a lot of other stories I could have told about synchronicities of times that I wanted this or like money or certain events or whatever. Or, and then synchronicities happen. In fact, I'm sure if you think in your own life, even if you're not a spiritually minded person, I bet you can think of times where you thought of something and then it happened. It was crazy synchronistic or very unlikely, we should say. Um, I'm focusing on, I picked this one because of the deep subjective meaning. And so I tell the story uh, to share some points that we're going to keep returning to throughout this magician archetype experience. But I, we need to start with the definition, right? Like, what is the magician archetype? Very clearly, I have to put it in one sentence. The magician archetype is the part of your psyche that brings intentions, brings your intentions into real form, right? So again, you could take this as the creative process. You come up with an idea, you write it. That's, that's, that's magic of a sense. You could also take it on the other end of like, you're dreaming of a certain outcome and then things randomly align and it happens. Uh, we could also look at, I mean, all of these things we can break down in different ways, but essentially uh, magic is this experience of subjective meaning of, uh, of interesting intention. And the last thing I'll say on the magician archetype as a concept, and then one of the reasons why I had to do this last out of the four uh, Gillette and Moore archetypes is that uh, every other archetype can kind of fit as a part in the hero's journey, right? Like the, the warrior, it takes, the warrior's, the hero's journey is largely the path of the warrior, like uh, picking some external goal and working through it in, uh, in material reality. Excuse me, for most men, the king archetype is what occurs towards the end of a given hero's journey where he's conquered something, he's established his power, he's, he's then moving into a new level of responsibility, returning to the Shire as a hero or whatever. Uh, the lover, it's kind of like the B storyline of the hero's journey. It's, um, it's like, you know, it's the side quest. It's the, his, it's, you know, if you think of the hero's journey from a masculine perspective, the lover archetype is his connection to his anima, is his connection to the manic pixie dream girl or the love interest who teaches him lessons about life while he's conquering life or, or taking on challenges in life. But the magician is a little different because the magician isn't really in the story. We, we could say that the magician is often... Uh, portrayed by the mentor in a given story, but in terms of your life journey, the magician archetype is not in the story. The magician archetype is the part of your psyche that writes the story. And we can keep going into narrative and like it, this weaves in perfectly with uh, the process of writing. Because if you think of your life as a story or as a movie, the magician is the part of you deep in your unconscious that writes the events. And you can take this on a, you know, a spiritual level of like, there's a part of you, maybe your daemon or your higher self that's writing all these events for you. Or you could take it on the other end of like, um, the magician is the part of your psyche that creates meaning, perhaps in reverse, to make the events of your life make sense. That's probably more of a, a grounded psychological way of looking at it. Either way, I'd say same thing. The magician is the meaning-making part of your life. So we need to define a few things. And we're actually going to take this episode in two parts. First is defining and really understanding what ma magic is in terms of the creative process, and two of how to actually cultivate creative potential and be a magician. So first, as we've spoken, uh, the magician is the sto story writer. So in many ways, if you compare this to the warrior archetype, the magician is kind of the immaterial counterpart. Like the warrior is what moves things in, in physical reality. The magician, doesn't really touch material reality. And so, so I'm just going to give you a, um, a, a simple example. It's a little bit of a cheeky example. Like if I pick up this, this, uh, this soda water and I move it across in front of me, that's definitely not magic. No one's going to think, no one's going to be like, whoa, I can't believe you did that. You know, like if you want to be a little cheeky, it's kind of the realm of the warrior of, uh, of using my muscles to assert will against this object and, and moving it in accordance with my intention. But that's not magic. Why is it not magic? Because I am uh, physically doing something. Like the cause and effect is very obvious. However, if I'm just here and you're looking at me on the screen and if you're watching the video of this and this bottle just levitates in front of me without my hands touching it and flies across the screen, that's pretty magical, right? That's, you know, that would be pretty astounding. 
um, for a less, uh, for a more realistic example, if I reach into your pocket and pull out your wallet and take $100 out and put it in my pocket, that's also not magic, right? In fact, that probably uh, very much tied to the realm of the warrior. You probably punch me in the face and we get into a fight and that's probably what would happen, right? No magic there. Clear causes and effects of how that $100 bill ended up in my pocket. <clears throat> However, if I say some words that means, if I make sounds out of my face that mean something to your language center, and through this process of just sharing ideas, doing nothing physically, you reach into your pocket and pull out your wallet and give me your $100 that's a little bit more magical. Now, we can look at this in different ways. Like if I, if the words that I said can be considered, they could be considered salesmanship. Maybe I convince you like, hey, you know, buy this soda water for me. It's, it's, it's worth so much more than $100 for you. It's gonna give you these benefits and you believe me. Whether or not it's true, not, not talking about ethics or morality, but if, if you believe that it's true and you, and you give me that uh, money through my words, that's a little bit more magical. <clears throat> If I do it through some sort of uh, oratory appeal of like, you need to give this hundred dollars because there's kids starving here and it matters whether or not I'm telling the truth. If you believe me and you feel like this has to happen and you pull out your that hundred dollars and you give it to me without any physical effort on my on my part, that's a little magical too. If I do this through propaganda of convincing you that this has to happen for our country's war effort, or if I convince you through religious authority that um, if you don't give me $100, uh, God will damn you to hell or something like that, or God wants you to give me $100. Regardless of whether it's true, regardless of whether this is ethical, we're not thinking about morality, we're not even thinking about that. If you believe it's true and you do it, that's basically magic. And finally, if I do something like hypnotize you and cast a spell on you and you become a zombie and give me your money, that's also kind of magical, right? I'm illustrating this point because essentially what we're, we're, what we're gonna define as magic is creating a real effect on reality without, uh, the mo the, without an obvious physical cause, right? That's the difference, right? And we can look at this at, uh, in the creative lens, we can look at it from a kind of a mystical lens. But let's, let's go back to the creative lens for a second. <clears throat> so let's stay grounded. Um, the Mona Lisa, or pick, pick some famous painting, most people believe, perceive, that this is a meaningful configuration of matter, right? The paint, that Da Vinci uh, put together to, to make the Mona Lisa isn't worth a lot. But the Mona Lisa in the configuration that it is, with every paint molecule where it is, with every brush stroke that put it together, makes it incredibly valuable. I have no idea how much it's worth, but a lot of people perceive it to be valuable. A lot of people get a real effect from beautiful art. Even if you, if any valuable art piece, if you reduce it down to the material, it's almost it's probably very low value, but in the configuration that it is, it's super valuable. It's, it has a lot of meaning, it has a real effect on people. So what is this? Why, what, what is this exactly? <clears throat> so essentially, what the, magician, the magician's tools are belief and meaning. Uh, and essentially what the magician does, or what anyone does to create meaning, to create uh, narrative in your life, is reducing entropy. So. If, if you're in the Mask on Underground group, I actually did a whole episode just on entropy. It came actually from uh, some ideas I had after eating an edible. Um, ended up being a little bit too abstract. So, and, and also the recording didn't come out well because um, I'm using a new microphone and I'm a loud American speaker. And uh, anyway, the, the vo anyway, I deleted that. But I, I'm wondering this whole thing of like, uh, what creates meaning from anyone's subjective perception is a reduction of en entropy. Entropy is randomness, right? It, throughout life, there's uh, all these random stimuli. I mean, we can think of, um, you know, re reality is a soup of energy and matter. However, certain configurations mean more to us, right? Like if we have a 300 page book and we shuffle up all the pages, there are almost infinite. There's hundreds of thousands of configurations where this, these pages mean nothing to us. But there's one configuration where, you know, if you actually order it from 1 to 300, where it's meaningful. Things are meaningful when they have uh, less likely permutations, right? So like, <clears throat> for instance, at the opening story, like the fact that my girlfriend was able to get on a plane in the exact tiny window that it fit, that it seems magical. That, that seems meaningful because that's something that matters to me. Um, essentially, if you want to look at it from a psychological perspective, Things are meaningful, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. We, we feel a sense of security when we can see patterns that match something that means something to us. So 
one example I gave in that in that style episode that I deleted was one of the reasons why little kids like to rewatch the same movie over and over again is because for a little kid, for a four year old, life seems so random. They don't have enough experiences to know what things mean something and what things don't. Like so, to just watch the same movie, to watch The Lion King over for like the five hundredth time, it gives them a sense of security because in this soup of stuff, like. I, you know, the first time they see a certain animal, they don't know if it's a common animal or not. Like everything is new to them. To see something that they can recognize gives a sense of peace. It gives a sense of meaning. So meaning is, is anything with a lower entropy, uh, a less likely permutation of reality that gives us uh, something that matters to us. And just, just, you know, this thing on, you know, this, anyway, I, I don't want to keep repeating myself. So when it comes to creative quality, even though creative quality is subjective and specifically because it's subjective, Anything that's considered good art, for instance, or good oratory or good writing is a reduction in entropy, low entropy. Uh, Timothy Leary used the word neg entropy to just be the opposite of entropy. A reduction of entropy um, that means something to the person consuming it. That's, that's essentially it. I know that we're getting a little nerdy here, but I think this is important to understand of like the creative process and magic. <clears throat> so, uh, and all of this comes down to value perception. So for a totally different uh, realm where this is um, true. We're kind of in the age of the magician in a sense because uh, value, n never before in history has value been so separated from matter, right? Like once upon a time, uh, money was way more in the realm of the warrior, right? Like money was gold or money was bushels of corn or something. Now we're in a place, especially I've been playing around with crypto. Like some, some of these things with cryptocurrency, I'm not an expert in it by any means, but like, it's so ridiculous, right? It's like, like uh, there's this thing called NFTs. Uh, if you're familiar with crypto, you, you know I'm gonna give a, a layman's explanation. Uh, an NFT, a non-fungible non token, is basically um, uh, creating a scarce property with something that doesn't physically exist. So like there's actually this NFT that I'm thinking of um, investing in. These are like, these are essentially uh, possessions uh, that exist only in the blockchain, right? So like Grimes, the, the, the musician, uh, she put one of her albums out on an NFT, which means you can pay to have this, uh, to have like ownership in quotes of her of her album, but it only exists in the blockchain, right? And there's this NFT that I'm thinking of um, investing in where they're basically making baseball cards, which I mean, I used to collect baseball cards as a kid. They're basically making baseball cards that only exist in the blockchain. So like, and I mean, I don't want to get too deep into this. This is, this is where, you know, uh, your magician mind can like just spin out. But essentially, um, we're, we're, uh, value is becoming so separated. Like if you look at like one of the big uh, criticisms of cryptocurrency is that it doesn't actually affect real matter. Uh, it, you know, it's, um, it's, its value is completely based on perception. But the argument against that is that all value has always been uh, uh, based on perception. Anyway, the, the, the point, uh, you know, we're going to bring this back to something more simple. The thing to understand, as far as the magician archetype, is that uh, information, you know, our perception of what configurations, what permutations of reality mean something, is subjective, and it can act independently of matter. So for a different example, um, you probably heard this statistic before, but the cells in your body completely regenerate every seven years, right? Like I think different parts of your body regenerate at different uh, rates. I don't remember exactly what it is, but like I think every four years, all of your skin cells are, are you know, replenished. I mean, different organs uh, completely regenerate themselves. You know, like cells are dying and cells are being created all the time. Every, every seven years, all the living cells in your body have completely regenerated, meaning there's not a single molecule that's in your body right now that existed in your body seven years ago. However, even though the, the matter that makes up you is completely different, the organization of you, the being of you, the meaning of you is still the same. Like the, the consciousness that inhabits this matter that constantly is filtering out exists. Like, so there's some configuration, there's, some, there's something, we can conceptualize it as an energy body if you want to go spiritual, or like there's a sequence of, there's, a, there's an organization of matter that means something, that means you as a human being, right? So, so wanna, you know, this is the realm of the magician where you're seeing that there are configurations of meaning that can be applied to matter, but they can act independently of matter. Cryptocurrency is something where like, it's completely disconnected from matter, but we can also see this in, in things like propaganda and um, cre creativity. Going back to the art example, 
the, the molecules of paint that make up the Mona Lisa are almost worthless, but in the configuration that da Vinci put it in, it's incredibly valuable. <clears throat> so what does this mean to you? Like you might be, all right, we're nerding out a little bit. How is this applicable to you? As I mentioned earlier, the magician archetype is the part of your psyche that makes meaning. A lot of people, especially in personal development, sometimes like attack this idea of like creating stories. Like you'll often hear coaches sometimes say like, oh, like you're attached to the story of the victim, right? And all of that's true. Like we want to, part of being the magician is recognizing stories and rewriting stories. But essentially the magician's value to you is that it weaves the narrative of your life. Essentially, your life story, your perception of the hero's journey of going through whatever struggles you're going through. Like we spoke about the road of trials. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I got a lot of positive feedback. I got a lot of people message me about the Road of Trials episode. I think, I mean, a lot of people said like it helped them through a hard moment because essentially in, in one perception, people who are in a hard time got to re, uh, re-narrate what their hard time was, right? Like they can reframe it. It's like Tony Robbins or the NLP terminology of like reassigning meaning to the same events, right? For like a lot of people reached out to me who are like struggling right now, who are like frustrated or creatively stuck. By listening to the Road of Trials episode, they got to nothing changed in their in their actual reality in the moment. They got to rewrite the narrative of what this hard time in their life means and move through it because of a change in meaning. So like this is the power of the magician. This is why like understanding these configurations of like what permutations mean something to you. Uh, why this all matters, right? It's not just nerding out about reality or going to LSD brain, although we're going to talk about that in a second. <clears throat> Let me just make sure I didn't miss anything. You're, the narrative of your life is the string of value perceptions or significant feelings that you've put in order, right? The reason why we are all, are so, all so drawn to stories is that when we watch a hero's journey in fiction, it resonates with the string of meanings that is kind of embedded in our, in our unconscious as the way that we should be progressing as a, as a being, as a soul, if you will, or a consciousness. <clears throat> Without the magician archetype, life is totally just a bunch of random stimuli. I mean, uh, you can see like one of the reasons, again, why kids like to repeat watching the same videos over or singing the same songs is that it, it, that's kind of their, the magician archetype forming of like, hey, this is a meaningful configuration, like, because otherwise life is too random. It's like a little random story. Actually, this always happens to me on LSD, sometimes when I'm on mushrooms too, where <clears throat> right when the trip is coming on, uh, whatever, we could call it my magician archetype, uh, you know, expanding or something, or actually what my experience is, I start to forget all the meanings that mean something, right? It's not that I forget how to speak. It's not that I forget uh, how to move or do things or, or what base reality is. But I forget all the meanings, and this happens almost every time on Amasid, where I forget the names of the people I'm with, I forget my name, I forget my identity, I forget all the labels, right? Because the magician archetype is putting labels on things to make meaning. I forget all of these things, and I forget why people do things, and like, there's always an experience that is always funny to look back on, but it's kind of, it's kind of terrifying, where like, I don't know what meanings to make of anything, so everything seems so random. And actually, I told this story on Instagram, uh, but... On my 26th birthday, I think, I did a bunch of acid with my then girlfriend and, uh, oh, she actually didn't do it. She wanted to have sex. I ended up going down on her and I ended up peaking right when, I, I, well, I started peaking while going down on her. And I, while I was in the process of it, I totally forgot the point of what we were doing. I forgot like why I even have a face. I forget like, like what is the point of all of this? Like all of, it became so ridiculous to me that peep that we are shaped in the way we are then we, I would put this hole on that hole and like, what is the point of that like it, it became I mean that's essentially all of the meanings I've created over my life kind of being washed away so that you could create new meanings which is why a lot of people are able to find um, they can rewrite their stories like uh, when guided properly on psychedelics because psychedelics kind of um, Neil Goldsmith who's, who was on the podcast years ago said what psychedelics do is they kind of make your old layers become translucent so you can like see through them and like rearrange them and perhaps make new meanings um which, which this is gonna be our transition into the second part of this episode <clears throat> beneath the magician archetype and this actually can be seen in, in uh western occultism in the tarot card deck uh beneath the magician archetype or before the magician archetype the foundation of the magician archetype is the fool archetype so in the tarot deck uh the fool is, the magician is number one is the first card in the major arcana 
the, magi- uh, the fool is zero. And actually, the major arcana, I don't know a ton about tarot, and I, I'm not like, I'm not into divination on cards necessarily, but kind of like Carl Jung, and maybe because of Carl Jung, I, I really appreciate the, the symbols that are in tarot. Um, and the major arcana, which are like the, the numbered cards that don't have suits in a tarot deck, follow what's called the fool's journey or the magician's journey, which is supposed to show the evolution of consciousness uh, from one archetype to the next. And actually, Timothy Leary has a whole book on this, um, forgetting the name of it, but he goes through each one and how each card in the tarot deck represents a stage of consciousness. The fool is the most, you know, people think of the fool as this negative thing, if like the fool doesn't know anything, but the fool actually recognizes uh, the, the reality beneath all of the narratives. The, the magician is the part of you, or the, the experience of writing, consciously writing narratives. Like if you want to think, I do like thinking of like, there's a part of my unconscious that kind of writes the, my life story to give it interest, interest and meaning. Um, in times that I'm stuck, perhaps I'm not uh, working with the director of my life properly. Like me, my ego being the actor, the director's trying to make, try to guide the story one way and I'm fighting it, that's what causes suffering or pain. As opposed to, as I mentioned, the Road of Trials episode, moving through it because, uh, you know, this challenge has been presented to make life interesting. Um, but the fool, the fool is a part of consciousness even beneath that. The fool is a part that recognizes that everything the magician writes for the things that come later are just a story, right? Beneath of all the meanings that we make, uh, deeper than all the meanings, is a reality that's more real. And I know we're getting a little, we're getting maybe a little spiritual, but uh, this is, I think, a very useful uh, process also for the creative process. The fool is a part of you that can take you out of the story or pop out of the movie theater, right? So like, you know, stories aren't bad, and it sometimes it's useful or fun to descend your consciousness. And the example I like to use is if you're watching a scary movie and you like scary movies and you want to be scared by the movie because that's the experience you want to have, uh, it doesn't help to watch the movie and think, oh, that's just a special effect. Oh, uh, this, this person, she's not really dying. She was in another comedy that I saw last week. Her name is blah, blah, blah. Like if you, if you constantly break the scene and, and like look at what's beyond the scene, you're not going to enjoy the movie, right? To really enjoy a movie, you have to enter the reality of the movie. However, if you are stuck in the reality of the movie and you're so terrified and it's just becoming a very unpleasant experience, it's very useful to remember, hey, step outside of the screen, it's just a movie. That part of you is the fool. The fool essentially, uh, and if you look at a tarot card of the fool, the fool is usually doing something dangerous. Like the fool is often like this, usually represented by a happy-go-lucky youth, usually hanging over a cliff or doing something that all of us know is a really dangerous thing, but to them it seems oblivious. It's not because it's oblivious. The fool archetype recognizes, you know what, this this material reality that we live for these stories, it doesn't really matter. Like nothing really, I mean, I might fall and die, but everything's going to really be okay because there's some other immaterial realm that I belong to, right? And this is, this is the innocence uh, that we see in children um, and it's often represented by, the, by trickster heroes in, in, in uh, films, right? Like in Looney Tunes, almost all the heroes, Bugs Bunny, I um, can't think of anyone else, Bugs Bunny, uh, the Roadrunner, um, they're, they're all trickster archetypes. They're all trickster heroes that do all these, these uh, seemingly um, impossible things or dangerous things fearlessly because they recognize that reality is not what it appears to be. I know it's maybe a deeper way of looking at Looney Tunes, but that is, that is why it resonates with us. <clears throat> Actually, a great example, uh, or a, a real life example, if you're an MMA fan, uh, last weekend Kevin Holland uh, fought um, Derek Brunson. Kevin Holland's so fun to watch because even when he's losing, even when he's getting his ass kicked, uh, he's making jokes and he's not taking the loss seriously. And actually a lot of people criticize him because he just lost actually, perhaps by not taking it seriously. Uh, People criticize him because all that joking is really cool and really fun when you still win, but when you don't win, it's it just it's just not funny actually. But still, he represents the the a trickster archetype uh, in sports because he he doesn't take the material things so seriously, so he can maintain a sense of humor. A sense of humor is something we're going to get back to in terms of rewriting uh, rewriting your life. <clears throat> which brings us to part two of this episode, <clears throat> which is uh, removing resistance. So. For someone to really be creative, 
if you look at if you just look at writing, for instance, you got to be able to overcome writer's block, right? For someone to really uh, intend their their vision, their outcomes into being, you have to be able to remove whatever. You know, this is a spiritual way of looking at it, but you know, you have to remove your emotional blocks to having the thing, right? Whether you call it fear of success or something more spiritual. So the next section we're going to talk about that because before, and actually, you know. Uh, Real occultists like Aleister Crowley, for instance, or Peter Carroll, they often warn that if you don't remove certain blocks of your ego or certain attachments, magic can get kind of dangerous, right? And I would, I would translate this to mean uh, if you try to do these complex things with your mind, but you're trapped in resentment or you're trapped in small thinking or you have some sort of psychological blocks, it actually can make you go crazy. And I've seen this happen with people who like go really deep into uh, uh, spiritual lenses of reality, but they're kind of trapped by fear. So it ends up perverting into like paranoia. Like I knew this one guy, I know this one guy who got really into this stuff. He was like a personal development junkie. He wanted to be a life coach, um, but he could not confront certain basic fears. Um, and because of that, he, his mind, he's a very smart guy, his mind kind of morphed into this very false narrative where he literally, it was kind of like, it was kind of like, uh, you know, he became kind of schizophrenic where he was sure that guys in black coats were out to get him. Um, almost like the plot of A Beautiful Mind. Like, and he would, he would call me, and I've known this guy for years, I actually don't know what he's up to now, but um, he would call me and be like, the, the, those men in black coats are there again. Like they're here to, to, to foil me. Like he, he went very deep into delusions and it's very, very sad because from my perspective, it's obvious that his fears, when, uh, when empowered, his fears basically combined with his very high intellect to create a story, a very complex story that he believes to be real that obviously one is not real to the rest of us and two is very disempowering. It's almost like he created a very complex way to justify not taking action on certain things, which is a shame. So one must, if one is going to go deep into the unconscious mind to perform what we can call magic, it's very important to clear a certain block. So bringing us back to a more grounded lens, if you just think about the creative process, just say being a writer, or being some sort of artist, creator of some sort, the creative process has two stages, right? There's the conceptualization stage, like to, to put something out to the world, your mind has to be clear enough to identify, identify configuration of stuff, whether you're imagining a written piece or imagining a video or imagining uh, a painting, like there has to be some, some idea, some conceptualization that has to be clear enough that you can start to take action, that's one. And two, you have to actually have the energy to put it into reality, whether it's moving the brush stroke or starting the business or hitting record on the video or whatever. <clears throat> Resistance can happen in two ways, but I see a lot of people get stuck the most with the first one, um, which is uh, mental resistance. Like they can't even conceptualize it long enough to take action. Uh, this can show up as mental fog, as ungroundedness. I'll say that this is what happens to me sometimes where I have a very exciting idea, but my mind is in such divergent mode where I'm like picking up, I'm making all these connections that like it starts to spiral out and out and out and like, oh man, I can't. I can't even explain what I'm thinking because it's it's so far. Like that's something that's that's one of my uh, one of my I guess issues or, or ongoing things that happens sometimes. <clears throat> so let's start with this uh, resistance and um, and actually I just want to go off of this uh, the War of Art, which I which I think is the best book on creativity of all. In the War of Art, uh, Stephen Pressfield uh, uses the term resistance with a capital R as making it the enemy of creativity. And in many ways, what he does for us as the reader, and this is, this is considered good marketing, is he identifies a term. He makes, it, he makes resistance to a, into a proper noun, so we have something to focus on to, in a sense, blame or fight against in terms of our creative process. Uh, in a sense, Stephen Pressfield is doing some magic of like, for, for all of us who, are, who try to be creative or who are creative, we all know the experience of like, the creativity is just not flowing. And sometimes it can be hard to explain or to con even conceptualize. Pressfield does us a huge favor and actually helps us simplify it by labeling it resistance. So he's actually doing some magic. He's acting as a magician to put a, a label on this thing so we can perceive it as real and attack it, right? Actually, on, on my last interview, episode 101 with uh, Cam Sapa, I, I asked him about um, the terminology he, he coined 
called dopamine fasting and dopamine fasting has been attacked by different people and you know whatever we talk about that in that episode but i asked him about like if he thought much about the terminology because essentially he took a practice that has existed forever i mean basically cultivating attention put a label on it and the one of the benefits that he's given the world by putting a label on it uh, you know aside from his protocol of how to do it is by putting a label on it he makes it easier for people to treat something as real when something has a label this is this is the realm of the magician when you add a label on something it becomes more real <clears throat> and that's what Pressful does anyway resistance I'm going to use his term that he, he labeled as real work off of his magic um, and labeling on enemies so what Pressfield doesn't get into is why resistance exists and uh, maybe for some people you don't care why resistance exists but if you want to you know go on the total other end from a spiritual level it's kind of answering the question why do bad things happen to good people as well uh, I'm gonna give you a belief that I believe that I feel is useful in understanding these things and actually it's, it's a, a belief that can be very empowering in terms of your creative process but also navigating life in a way where you don't get emotionally stuck but I do want to you know, make a uh, distinction between provable beliefs and workable beliefs. And this is, I'm drawing from Catherine McCoon's book on becoming an alchemist, which is everything that we can consider magic or magical thinking or magic with quotes around it, it typically is a workable belief, meaning by employing this belief, you can get a desired effect, right? But it doesn't mean it's provable, right? If something's provable, that's in the realm of science. Some things are both provable and workable. Like dopamine fasting is something proven by science. It's also a workable protocol. But when you, when you start to talk about things that are less and less material, and I'd say the creative process is one, like creativity often feels magical, even if you're a total atheist, because it's just like, oh, this idea, this configuration of information, just where did it come from? It came out of nowhere. Um, when we lean on things like that, or especially if you go into anything spiritual, you start to come across beliefs that are definitely not provable. If they're provable, they'd be science, but they are workable. And I'm making this distinction, again, to keep us grounded, of recognizing that some beliefs are simply useful. I mean, Jim Carrey uh, had this in his, uh, he gave this commencement speech to, I think it was Maharishi University, where he was saying like, he said he was, he was talking about the law of attraction or something. He's like, I can't prove any, I can't prove any of that is true but I choose beliefs that I find useful for my life or something like that, right? So this is, this is a belief that I, that I offer you that <clears throat> if you're wondering why the hell does, why do bad things exist? It's because the universe doesn't give a shit about good and bad. I mean, that's not the actual thing, but uh, resistance exists to counterbalance creativity because nature wants everything in balance, right? To a person, an individual person who's making a subjective meaning, a human centric or egocentric meaning, you're like, oh man, like, Everything should happen, you know, why do, why do good things, why do bad things happen if I did this thing is good? Because nature, the universe, does not have a definition of good and bad that us humans do. We're actually going to talk about the, the evolution of morality because I think it's useful. Um, nature doesn't give a shit. Nature just wants things to continue and for things to continue they have to be in balance. If creativity became unbridled, uh, you know, reality would fall apart in a sense. The universe, nature, is kind of in, indifferent to in, individual units, but what it does want is a movement towards complexity. Uh, and for a grounded example, you could look at any ecosystem. In a healthy ecosystem, in a sustainable ecosystem, in an ecosystem that will continue to have evolving life forms and where life will continue to exist, there has to be a balance between predators and prey. You know, the gazelle can be like, oh, why does a lion eat me? Well, that's, this is the only way it works, right? If the lions didn't eat the gazelles, there wouldn't be any more lions and nature wants things to exist. It doesn't care, it, it, it's, but it's largely indifferent to morality, right? Not to say that you always have to, to not to say that you should go into this belief to the degree of nihilism, but I find this is actually a very empowering idea of like, if you just think like, I think this is one of the solutions to entitlement, this idea that, oh, I should have this and this and this. It's like, the, nature, the universe doesn't give a shit about you. Everything is a, is a, comes down to cause and effect and certain probabilities. And if you can really accept that, it takes away a lot of what I'm identifying as creative blocks, like resentment, like loathing, like, and we're gonna talk about that in a second. <clears throat> but to, to bring us back, because for most of us, even if you're atheistic and in, in this age, if you're an intellectual, very few people take old world religions seriously. Um, even still, most of our perceptions of reality as a people 
uh, are based on previous perceptions, right? As I spoke about in the Breaking Social Constructions of Reality episode, I think it came out in November uh, last year, uh, we, we talk about this in more detail of how um, belief forms and moralities exist and how they've evolved to become better and better at controlling populations, but at the expense of taking away individual creativity. So we want to reclaim our creativity, recreate our, our ability to influence uh, real events in life. So I'm actually going to reference um, Peter Carroll's book, Liber Null, where he, he broke this down in a very, uh, yeah, in a very clear way historically, which I'm into. He, he identified five stages of belief that humans have had. So once upon a time, uh, you know, the, the root of every culture's belief started with some version of animism or shamanism, where there's some belief in like there are forces of nature. Uh, they're kind of indifferent to us, but as people, excuse me, if we can align ourselves with these forces of nature, we're going to be better off, right? So like I briefly, <laughs> I told about telling the story of the Genghis Khan thing. He had shamans and like they did some prayers and then they then thunderstorms happened and they assigned the meaning of how we called in these thunderstorms or something like that, right? You see, almost every culture starts with this because it's actually the closest to direct observation. Why does rain happen? I don't know, but it just happens. How can we work ourselves around that? Um, it's essentially the application of human meanings to stuff that just exists. Astrology is one of the best examples of this. Uh, primitive peoples uh, looked up at the sky, they saw all these glowing dots, but then they started to string things together and like uh, uh, connect some of these dots and be like, oh, that's, hey, like, that looks like a guy with a, with a bow. It's a Sagittarius, right? Like, this looks like a, a spoon. Let's call it the little, little dipper. It must represent plentifulness of cups or whatever meaning people uh, assigned. And it's interesting because if you look at different cultures, different people, different peoples, identify different configurations in the same stars, right? Like I don't, I don't know enough about this to to, to know, but I, I do know like uh, certain parts of the little dipper are part of another configuration, like another astrological thing, right? It's not because these guys were uh, less intelligent, but they did have less access to technology. Um, but they had a—they were just trying to assign meanings in the same way that a little kid tries to watch the same thing to be like, okay, this is something that matters, right? They look at the stars, they looked at different elements, and they assign meanings. This gave way to paganism. Paganism is essentially, uh, it builds off of animism, or, and, but it assigns more personified meanings. So most pagan uh, belief systems have personifications of these forces, right? It's not just thunder energy coming out. Oh, I just want to say, actually, this animism thing, Taoism, which is not animism at all, has a similar function of like, there is some flow to the universe, and if you can align yourself with it, you tend to do well, and if you fight against it, you tend to do poorly. This is perhaps an important creative principle. Paganism takes us one step away from that of... Uh, personifying these forces, right? It's not just thunder because thunder energy is coming down. It's that uh, Thor is swinging his hammer or Zeus is throwing down a lightning bolt. Like that is what um, you know they assigned meaning. And and this and then we start to see, whereas animism had amorality, things just are. Paganism had some somewhat of a subjective morality of like, oh, there is some personified force causing this thunder, causing this lightning. How can we make him happy, right? And we start to see this sense of subjective morality where people are essentially trying to be good to these forces that they've personified of like, how do we make the rain come? How do we make the rain goddess happy with us? How do we make the fertility goddess uh, send us good energy? So they did things that may seem primitive or certainly unscientific, but they did things with this attempt of creating meaning so they can create some sort of cause and effect. So we all look at back at this and like we look at a shaman shaking a rattle or some, or, and we're like, oh, that's magical thinking, right? Magical thinking with like the judgmental term with quotes around it. Magical thinking meaning false belief. But this was an attempt at creating meaning. And even if the shaking of the rattle or doing the rain dance didn't actually cause the rain, in those moments that it did, where they, you know, maybe when they shook the rattle and didn't come, they're like, oh, we didn't shake our rattle hard enough, right? We see this a lot in the law of attraction of like, oh, yeah, I was positive thinking and it didn't happen. It must be because I didn't think hard enough, right? Like that's what that's the reverse justification you often see where, where people kind of put themselves into a hole sometimes. Too much magician, not enough warrior. Anyway, paganism was an attempt at this. 
But this gave way to monotheism because the, one of the issues with paganism, and I talk about this in the History of Man um, series where we saw, speak about the evolution of warfare because warfare has uh, been the birth of masculine ethos. Um, one of the greatest or one of the most significant advancements in warfare and with the development of civilization was monotheism because paganism, while it allows, which is a little, paganism is a little closer to nature, you have all these dueling forces, paganism doesn't have objective morality because if morality is, if good is what is beneficial to us and bad is what's bad to us and the gods are what determine our reality, sometimes it's hard because what the god of war wants and the god of love want are sometimes the opposite, right? Like, how do you appease both the god of war and the goddess of love? Like, sometimes you have to choose sides. So morality, in a sense, is subjective. And, like, you can see, like, seafaring nations, like the Phoenicians, uh, praised Poseidon over everyone else. Like, they knew that there were other gods. They believed there were other gods, but they didn't, they didn't uh, cherish uh, what the, the lord of the sea wanted more. Like, they chose their moralities. And this, this uh, anyway, this became very hard... Uh, it, but this perception of subjective morality made it hard to unite a people and, and field armies that can do something. You know, essentially, the Crusades was a really powerful um, application of magic that the Pope did. You know, the, the Pope said some words, he sent out some meanings, and he got thousands and thousands of warriors throughout Europe to, to travel uh, for, for months to get down to the Middle East and kill people they have never met because of some words. Like, that's some really powerful magic. <clears throat> Anyway, monotheism allowed for something like that because paganism, when there's subjective morality, there's many gods to please, it becomes very hard to unite a people or unite a reality, their subjective reality. Monotheism has, says there's one god, therefore there's only one version of good and evil, and if you all follow this, we all can be on the same page. So this was very effective in uniting people for things like war or for things like state, but it was also far more oppressive than paganism because if someone, there's only one set of rules to follow, right? Paganism allowed, you know, you could choose, in a, in a sense, you can choose what God to follow. <clears throat> so it's really good for war, really bad for freedom, but monotheism gave way to atheism. Um, atheism, uh, you know, whereas uh, monotheism gave an objective morality, atheism, uh, or uh, objective morality, atheism gave an objective reality. If like, now we know science, uh, you know, we have all of this side, we have all these ways of observing material reality, so we can detach it from gods. It wasn't God that created this, it was this, and like, all these scientific theories. However, while this has been a great advancement in not getting diluted and uh, having more direct causes and effects, like now we know that shaking a rattle doesn't necessarily cause the rain to come, but it's caused by changes in pressure and in condensation in the atmosphere, we did lose some of our magician qualities. We did lose some of our meaning. And uh, there's a quote that, um, did I copy it? Well, essentially Carol wrote that the expense of all of this intel intelligence was that we, we lost the meaning of things. Like we know we can um, identify all the hows of how things happen. But we kind of lose the whys sometimes of like why, you know, science cannot answer why do good things happen to bad people. I have to give you uh, uh, an unprovable belief that I believe to be true. Um, and with it, and actually Carl Jung spoke about this in how even though Western people, and he's, he was writing this, in, you know, uh, about 100 years ago now, but um, he was saying that primitive people, because he spent some time in uh, South America uh, observing indigenous people, he's like, even though primitive people don't know as much about the world, a lot of them were more psychologically healthy. And the example he gave was that um, a primitive man, you know, what he was calling an indigenous person in South America, might experience what he perce he perceives to be demons. He's like, oh, there's a demon in my head, and like, you know, it's, it's preventing me from doing things, it's preventing me from socializing. So he goes to see a witch doctor, and the witch doctor says, yes, this is a demon, this is the demon this, and, and this happened because you did this uh, last, last season, and this demon has cursed you, but I know how to fix it. Here, shake this rattle, drink these herbs, go pray at this mountain, and the demon will leave, and you'll be fine. The person, uh, you know, we, we call this self-fulfilling prophecy now, but the, the primitive man takes this belief, he believes this belief, he fully believes in this reality, he does the actions, and the demon, he perceives a demon to leave, and then he's fine. A Western person may have the same exact experience, but instead he's like, ah, oh, just I, I feel stuck, I can't socialize, I can't, like, I'm something, I'm not myself. He goes to see a shrink, the shrink says, oh, you have chronic anxiety. 
And then the guy said, well, how do I get, how do I get rid of chronic anxiety? Uh, you know, there's no rattle to shake. There's no herbs to drink. It's like, oh, well, anxiety is, you know, it's hard because uh, it's not because of something you did last season. You have this anxiety because your mother raised you this way for 25 years. And man, it's going to take, you know, you know, months. We're going to have to get to the root of this. And we're going to have to talk about this for five years to get over your anxiety. And Jung identified, like, man, the primitive version of this is so much more effective because the guy shakes the rattle, he prays a few times, and he's cured. I, I mean, the demon and anxiety are the same thing, right? Totally different meanings made, but something that we've lost in terms of perhaps healing or letting go of things is because we know the, the, the we, we know more things of how things actually work, we kind of lose the, the magical enchantment quality of things happening immediately, right? Like... Um, Use another ground example. If you work really hard and accumulate a bunch of money and you save 10% of your income, and for years and years and years, eventually that 10% grows into a big nest egg, that's nice, right? It doesn't, it's more warrior stuff. It doesn't feel magical. But if you're like, man, I want X amount of dollars, and then you think about it and you do some actions and you get into the flow, and then someone just gives you a check, that feels magical, right? I'm not saying this is possible or impossible, even though I'm sure all of us. What I will say is, if you entertain the more magical viewpoints, magic seems to happen more, right? And again, it might be self-fulfilling prophecy, right? If you, if you, the more you choose to make meaning, the more meanings show up. If you're looking for synchronicity, this is something I, I go into pretty deeply in the in a mask and archetype challenge. It's to, in the most grounded way, look for synchronicities in your life. Look for meanings that are will serve you in your life, and you'll see more of them happen over and over again. Anyway, I'm jumping a little ahead of myself. <clears throat> this is all to say that atheism, while it's great for understanding the universe, has had us lost some of our, lose some of our storytelling and our meaning making. And atheism very often um, deteriorates into nihilism, where you see these atheists who. Can crit will go out and criticize all the people who don't, you know, who believe in these things are unprovable. But very often, not always, very often these people, these people, <laughs> I don't mean to sound judgmental, but very often like the, the militant atheist has this nihilistic worldview and they're very often not happy. Whereas, you know, and I used to be one, I used to be, I used to be very critical of anyone uh, religious. I, uh, in college, actually, I'm not going to go into the story, but I had a buddy who, became a born again Christian essentially. It's actually, I mean, it's a little bit of a funny story. He wanted to get with this super Christian girl in college. He was super attracted to her. And he's like, I'll go to Bible study to show her I'm a good guy and, uh, and then she'll like me and then I can bang her and whatever. Like, he was a frat boy. He's, he's kind of stereotypical. Um, no judgment, that's who he was. But he started going to Bible study to like basically get in her pants. And he essentially, I mean, whatever Bible study, I don't know what they do in Bible study, but it actually changed him. And the next time I saw him, this was like a semester later, after like winter break, he no longer drank, he no longer partied, no longer swore, and he totally changed his life and he ended up marrying this girl. So actually it was a great thing. And with the, the thing that, um, this actually was the thing that had me stop being a militant atheist. I could see that before, when he was an atheist, he was a pretty troubled guy. Uh, he got into fights a lot, like he, he wasn't particularly happy, like he wanted to get pussy to fill a hole in his heart, essentially. But when he became a born-again Christian, even though that's not my thing, you know, it's not a worldview I choose to subscribe to, he became so happy, right? Like he was very clearly a way happier person. And I was like, man, I, I can't argue with that. Like, even if these beliefs beliefs are not true in my worldview, or they're not true in reality, they're unprovable. Was Jesus the Son of God? Like, we can't actually prove one way or another. But clearly, this belief is serving him. Magician archetype. Okay. But Carol says that we are moving into a fifth stage, and I think this is, you know, this is part of like his work of chaos magic of a fifth stage that some people are, are delving into uh, is chaosism, which is essentially a return to the amoral uh, animism with the knowledge that we have from the atheistic age of our knowledge of science, but willfully assigning meanings to things to essentially activate our magician archetype and create meaning in our lives, right? The chaos magician, uh, in Peter Carroll's terminology, takes real knowledge. You know, they're not just making up hocus pocus. They take real knowledge, but they're specifically assigning meanings and sometimes descending consciousness or, you know, descending, you know, not ascending, descending consciousness, forgetting about the fact that you're in a movie theater and like choosing certain narratives that serve you, but then also having the um, dexterity of still connecting to the fool archetype where you can step outside of the theater when, when needed, right? Sometimes it's really fun to take 
a sporting event seriously where like your team has to win and like it riles you up and like you have to take it seriously to get those emotions but if your team loses and you're still feeling shitty on monday uh this is actually why i stopped watching football the Jets keep losing but uh if you still feel shitty on monday then you're kind of you're kind of failing yourself here like you, you chose to get into a reality that really doesn't matter like the jets success has no no effect on my actual life so there's no reason to uh assign meaning there that's the dexterity that comes with uh with the chaosism uh or that, that kind of magician archetype and uh, and i would say you could see this kind of in burning man communities or like you know like uh the tech scene which in many ways is uh the, the core of the atheistic movement of like going deep in technology, they're actually kind of in a sense, if you think of subcultures amongst humans right now, they're kind of like the, the people pushing, you know, the use of psychedelics, you know, all, all like in Silicon Valley, you hear this all the time, like uh, effectively using psychedelics to go deep and recognize things about yourself, like kind of the Burning Man, uh, the Burning Man millionaire who's been very successful in real life, but returning to these animistic ways of being by choice, not, not out of ignorance. <clears throat> and that's essentially the chaos movement. So what this chaosism lens or this activation, this intelligent activation of the magician archetype does is deconceptualization. In the same way that I mentioned on an LSD trip, I forgot the meanings of things. If you do this willfully, perhaps when you're not tripping, so you're still lucid, <clears throat> You can rewrite narratives and rewrite meanings. So this is all to say that in order to do magic, to really um, have your intentions appear in reality, whether through a creative work or through something more mystical, you have to be free of moral judgments. You have to be free of uh, the word should. The word should is one of the most disempowering things because the word should is a moral word. It only makes sense in the sense of morality. You should do this. That doesn't mean anything. Uh, even when someone gives advice, it's like, oh, you should totally, uh, you know, post more to Facebook. Like, wh what do you mean? Based on whose morality? Based on some perception of morality, some implied morality that you will be a better person or life will be better if you do that. It's a lot more effective to break everything into cause and effect statements. Instead of you should post more, it's if you post more, you'll have this result. That's a more grounded way of looking at things. But essentially... The more moral judgments you have, the more belief of like, you should be some way. This is actually the core of, of uh, most shame, internalized shame. Like, oh, I should be some way, or I should be like this person, or I should do this and not this, right? This, this should, the shoulding yourself uh, is essentially the antithesis of the creative process. The more you have these moral judgments, the more you're limiting the natural flow of expression we're gonna talk about in a bit, it's the final section. Uh, and that's why art often Tips to, tiptoes into taboos or perverse things. This is why, going back to the fool archetype or the jester, comedy almost always is on the edge of what's okay to talk about, right? Because if, uh, essentially with the fool archetype, I mean, one expression of the fool archetype is the, the court jester. The court jester was the only person in a given court that could speak the truth to power, right? The only person that who could make fun of the king. And there's various social reasons for this, uh, to keep the king uh, humble, um, to, to identify reality, but also to prevent the, the entire court from spinning out into this delusion that the king is actually a god. The jester has to call out uh, truths that crashes back into reality, and that release of tension usually comes out as laughter. Uh, if something is, does not resound, if something does not resonate with actual reality, it typically can't be funny. Um, so in a lot of magical and occult rituals, they use different processes to kind of like stun or delete your perception of how things should be. I mean, this can be done through, through drugs. It, uh, I mean, uh, very often is done through terror. A lot of magic goes into like kind of perverse or gross things for the reason of, I don't talk about occult magic, like magic with a K at the end, like what Aleister Crowley stuff. I'm not gonna go too deep into it, but a lot of their rituals are meant to kind of like stun you or stun your conscious mind, which is why they do, you know, even, even before that, if you go into like more indigenous ancient peoples, the reason why they had human sacrifices or later animal sacrifices or like do weird stuff, drink blood, orgiastic rites, like things that are just weird, weirdness kind of like, you know, it hones us in, it puts us like kind of in a survival brain where it kind of um, disables our conscious mind that's attached to certain stories. And when you're in that state, very often, like if you were, if I mean, I've never, I'll just say like if you uh, 
are witnessing something that's very unusual and very high sensation, like let's say a, a chicken being slaughtered or something, it, it forces you into reality. It stuns the story making potential and someone for good or for evil can implant a, um, a set of beliefs or stories, essentially a way to brainwash you uh, to perceive the world differently. That's the, the role of the magician. It's uh, giving you a new, a new meaning that you didn't uh, believe before. Um, and this is whether it's for good or for evil, it doesn't matter because for, to really tap into the magician, you have to kind of remove yourself from your, from your sense of morality for the sense of understanding that nature is kind of indifferent. And essentially, this is what even uh, churches do or regular uh, religious con congregations do where they, they do it in light ways, right? Like, but even, even drinking the body and blood of Christ is a sublimated version of this where obviously no one's going to be stunned by drinking a wine cup but at one point, this was perhaps, this came from pagan rituals of actually drinking blood where like something about that stimulates the nervous system where you become more impressionable and you can take in things. So for a more positive view, for a positive view on uh, church, for instance, they have you sing songs in unison, they have you follow certain ritualistic things to kind of shut off your hyper thinking brain so that when the, the, the priest says, you are all God's children and you are loved, you actually believe it. Like you actually feel it. It's like, oh yeah, God's got my back. Or like, you know, uh, be your brother's keeper. Like you're not, you're not thinking of all the reasons why you shouldn't be your brother's keeper. Like you actually take it in and you become a better person. Ideally, that's what happens. This could also be used uh, for negative purposes, like a la uh, propaganda. Hit, like Hitler's propaganda. Hitler was basically a really effective dark magician where by using his words, by sending out meaning into, into Germany, he was able to change a huge population's perceptions of reality very drastically so they felt justified in certain things that they later found to be abhorrent. You know, this is, this is, the, realm of the, this is the realm of the magician. All right. <clears throat> so in terms of being an effective magician, in terms of being uh, effective uh, with your creative process and shifting reality, the most important thing is that the artist, the creative person, the magician has to be real with his deepest self at the, the most precise level. Um, and essentially, when we, uh, in the Dark Masculine episode, uh, this is one element of that, of removing shame, of getting real with yourself and accepting yourself and re accepting reality the way it is, is important because in order to, in order to be able to play with reality, to play with... Uh, let's say like the, the magician's veneer, the story, the, the narrative part of reality, you have to at least perceive what's beneath it. At least perceive the, the consciousness that most people enter when they're on LSD of like, oh yeah, all of that shit, all of these things that bother me, they don't really matter. All these things that I want to get joy from, they also don't really matter. I'm choosing narratives that either give me joy or pain. And down here, this perception of this other world, this immaterial world, is what allows you to look objectively at the narrative world. This is, I mean, a lot of spirituality ha uses this model of like, you know, Christianity is like, oh, there's, there's heaven, right? Heaven, and I've heard this from a lot of, uh, you know, Christians, like heaven is the real life. This material life is just a practice life to prove to God that we're worthy of heaven, right? I've heard, that, I mean, you've probably heard this from religious people before. But there's something empowering about that belief system because if you, not to say that it's useful or always applied in a positive way, but... If you believe that this other world is actually more important, if you believe that your dreams or your inner monologue is more important than what's on the outside, you're never going to take the outside that seriously. And, uh, and uh, Carol has a quote that I can't find on my piece of paper. Um, let's see here. I mean, he's speaking about one of the techniques. Uh, by, a, by amoral cultivation of laughter, a magician can shrug off all losses and avoid... Uh, Avoid getting stuck in adverse states um, altogether if you want. Sorry, my, my handwriting is terrible. I can't even read it. But essentially what he was saying is like by entering this amoral sense of the world, not getting attached to stories or shoulds or morality, you can, you can basically not get stuck on emotions that, that stuck, stick people. So before we get into techniques, this idea of fidelity matters, right? Fidelity means faithfulness. And when I use it, I'm talking about faithfulness to truth. And it's not like, uh, you know, I say, I've said this in a few episodes, but I, I think this is one of the most healing concepts or most uh, mind-enhancing concepts of like 
How precise can you get with the truth? How real can you get? Because the more real you get with yourself, with the good, with the bad, and not having judgment, like this is just the way things are, this is what reality is, this is what I am, this is the reality of the situation, the more precise you can get and more you can admit, and this is, um, socially we call this vulnerability, if like just being able to admit things the way they are, uh, it, it increases the resolution of reality because now you're willing to see, see things. When someone becomes apathetic or emotionally shut down, it's kind of like their world becomes gray. This is something that I've mentioned as, a, as an idea before. Like their resolution becomes funny because fuzzy because if you're lying to yourself, if you are, and this you know I'll give the example with apathy that a lot of men experience these days. When a man when you feel when a man feels a certain desire for whatever, and they and he doesn't act on the desire, the only way that he can get over that cognitive dissonance is to try to convince himself they never had the desire in the first place. But that's not true. So in order to, um, in order to reconcile this difference between this, this lie to himself, he has to kind of no longer see reality as clear. It's like if you are trying to tell yourself that, um, that a, a, I don't know, a weed is a rose, right? If, you, if you're like, oh, this weed, it's a rose. I, I'm telling you it's a rose. And you look at it and it's a weed. Well, that's very hard to, uh, it's, hard to reconcile. But if you make the resolution on your, on your camera really terrible, if you make it uh, make reality really fuzzy so that it becomes blurry, well, you can be like, oh yeah, this weed is a rose. That's essentially, I mean, this is a Black Mirror episode, but essentially by blocking things, by making things harder to see, you can lie to yourself easily. And this is why truth matters so much. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, people who lie to themselves end up becoming apathetic. People who uh, try to reconcile conflicting emotions with a lie, with a mistruth, they end up losing their zest for life. It becomes hard to be enthusiastic when you're constantly lying to yourself about what, what is real for you. Um, so two things that uh, cause mental contraction, uh, well, I'll, say, I'll, I'll summarize it at one, uh, resentment. Resentment, so the magician, the magician's, uh, another useful belief for the magician, and maybe I should have said this in the beginning of the episode, is the chosen belief that you actually can influence events more than you can. I'm wording it this way, it's a workable model, it's not approvable, but this is something that is, uh, will make it easier. Well, essentially, this is what I was saying before, if, if you um, look for meaning, you'll find meaning, and life becomes more enchanting. If you, if you reduce everything down to the most nihilistic way of viewing things, your life will end up feeling nihilistic. Resentment, is a key emotion that goes against this magician's belief, right? The magician needs to believe that he can influence reality. If you are resentful at circumstances, if you're resentful at a person, if you are, you know, if you're blaming Donald Trump or Joe Biden, if you're complaining about the government or the way things are or, or whatever, or if you're resentful at people who are more successful at you, you're essentially saying to yourself, to your unconscious, there are things, my reality is outside of my control. It's uh, under the control of this person that I'm resentful at. It's in the control of um, the president of the United States. Like if you if you keep be, if you hold on to the feeling of resentment, you are essentially telling your own magician archetype, "Hey, you have no power." And the more you believe that, the less that you will have power. The less you will have influence over your reality. <clears throat> so, in in increasing your fidelity, you also need to reduce your resentment, which comes down to accepting things the way, the way they are. Socially, this means forgiveness. If you can really forgive someone, you're essentially saying, you don't have power over me. I'm no longer fearful of you or blame you for this thing because it doesn't affect my life. Like I'll say, like, I've, I'll admit I've had various resentments at ex-girlfriends uh, for different things. Things that I feel are very justified, but also pretty much everyone has some sort of resentment at their ex because of pain. But when I've entered my current relationship, where I'm so happy, we're like, man, I'm just so fucking happy. Like everything just like fits exactly the way I wanted it my whole life. I just, I mean, I didn't tell this in the beginning because I didn't want to get mushy, but like everything I've wanted is in this relationship and I feel so grateful. And because of that, I can't possibly be resentful at any of my exes. Like how could I possibly blame them when I'm so happy in that part of my life now? Gratitude clears up resentment. Uh, Truth telling clears up mental fog. Two actions that reduce mental resistance are gnosis. That is one, uh, I did a whole episode on this. This is essentially entering the experience of no mindedness. And this is a practice. This is a practice that you can practice right after you listen to this episode. You can even practice now where um, 
you do your best to not think, right? Do your best to just perceive. Gnosis means uh, knowledge or wisdom. Uh, it's can you not add a narrative to things and just perceive things the way they are? This is perhaps a mental way of uh, tapping into the fool archetype. Uh, actually, both of these are. The second is laughter, and this is something that uh, Peter Carroll speaks about because he speaks about in terms of uh, creative resistance or resistance, um, the root of every emotion is its opposite. It's a quote straight from his book. Um, so when you, this is, this is why in Law of Attraction they talk about setting an intention and forgetting it. If you think about something and you're like craving it, this is why in Buddhism they, uh, they, they say craving is the root of suffering. If you're craving something and you're gripping onto this, out, this future outcome so tightly, you're also increasing your resistance. You're increasing your creative, you're increasing your desire, but with it, you're also creating your resistance so they cancel each other out, right? Nature, nature wants a balanced checkbook. But if you have, you have an intention, and then this is why I brought it up in, in my initial thing, like I, th I saw my girlfriend and I thought I would love to date someone like that, right? And I didn't get attached to, I need to be with her, right? If I became, if, from a magical lens, if I, if I got attached to like, I need to be with her, I probably would have found some way to self-sabotage because I'd be gripping so hard on that outcome as opposed to, yeah, it'd be, it'd be great. So I had this descent, this uh, desire and I could send things in that direction and because I wasn't, I wasn't like focusing on it, I wasn't like gripping to it, um, the resistance didn't rise up to the desire. That's one way to look at it. The other thing uh, that Peter Carroll says, uh, that one of the actions uh, he sees is critical for the magician or creative person is laughter, right? As we mentioned with the fool archetype or the jester, things are funny when you crash back to reality. And in, uh, in Peter Carroll's words, laughter is the only action that is its own opposite, right? When you, laughter contains both the, the desire and resistance in itself, right? Laughter is like kind of a, a, a synergy. It's a, uh, a collapsing of duality for a moment where when you laugh at something, you're in full acceptance, right? There is no resistance against the desire. It's like the desire and resistance have met each other, which is why if you can laugh about things, you can reduce, th uh, you can reduce uh, resistance in yourself. If you can laugh about your writer's block, if you can laugh about... The fact that you have no money, if you can laugh about the, the fact that you just uh, lost your MMA fight or something, you know, that, that takes away resistance. We, we can, no, I don't know, I was thinking about Kevin Holland. Um, but one was also bring concept and meaning into matter. Wait, hold on. We have, oh yeah, and then physically, laughter is a physical release of tension. Tension, you know, if we go to back to Wilhelm Reich's uh, uh, idea of muscular armoring, of like chronic tension in the body is emotional tension that's preventing a flow of energy, what Reich would call organ energy. Reich being one of the people, kind of like Jung, that connected psychology with mysticism, but he leaned so far on mysticism that most people are not into his stuff anymore. Uh, laughter is a, is a release. Laughter is a collapsing. So, um, and uh, you know, with that, I just last bit before we speak about this last section, you can tell a lot about a person by the way they move. Um, one way to, and I spoke about this in the episode I ended up deleting on like what makes a good dancer. Like when someone is conscious of their movement and are specific, right? Like a bad dancer can be on rhythm, but if they're like flailing, like there's flailing and like moving without intention, that's very high entropy, right? There's a million ways to flail. There's only one way to move your, your hand exactly. There's only one way to have your head in balance with your spine. And you can tell a lot about a person. Uh, by the way they move, like if but people who have a lot of resistance emotionally tend to contract certain things and it causes stiffness and removement of flow. All of this, all of these things that we've spoken about over this last half hour have been about removing, removing your foot from the brake as your other foot's on the pedal. Which brings us to our very last piece, which is um, opening the floodgates. <clears throat> this has been, I know this has been a much longer episode. I mean, I've been thinking about it for months, so I had a lot of stuff here. Uh, this is actually going to be the shortest thing because, you know, just to do a quick recap between section three, if we understand the nature of what we're calling magic or the um, creative process beyond obvious cause and effect, right? Uh, and we look at these ways to deconceptualize or remove the hard material time perceiving story of like, oh, it takes forever for this to happen or like, 
oh yeah, the odds of me finding the perfect partner, that's just like, look at the numbers, it's so unlikely. Or, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're stuck on that material reality or stuck on different uh, emotions that cause this prevention of flow, like resentment or, um, or, or lying to yourself, it becomes impossible. But if you do those, if you do those things correctly, if you understand this model of reality, um, if you can remove these resistances in yourself, then things tend to open up on, on, its, on their own. So this last section is probably going to be the shortest, is on opening the floodgates. So I mentioned this earlier, in Western occultism, uh, most occult rituals are essentially ways to uh, send your energy, there's no, there's no better word to use than energy, send your energy in the direction of your intention without grasping. So because of the fact that when you focus on something and you become attached to the outcome, you, you, you add the same amount of resistance. A lot of rituals, I'm not, gonna, I'm not an expert on any of these, but you'll see in, in occult rituals, you'll see things like sigils, which are like symbols that are supposed to activate the desire in your mind, but they're not, it's not like writing, I want a million dollars. It's having a symbol that represents that so you don't get stuck on the outcome. You can just, your, your unconscious can just be stimulated. Different forms of meditation. As you mentioned, terror is one way. Uh, actually, I, I've mentioned this uh, in some of our sexuality episodes, but I mean, this is relevant here. Uh, and my buddy Omar Pani, who's been on the podcast a few times, uh, he, I, I've seen him demonstrate this in a podcast, in um, workshops rather, is like a lot of people ask, like, why are women especially into pain and sexuality? Why, why, why is it that like they like to be spanked or like they, uh, so many women like a hand on their throat? It's like very hard for an intellectual guy to grasp this sometimes. And one explanation is these types of fearful activities force you into your body. Like pleasure doesn't have very high stakes, right? If everything is light and everything is pleasant and gratitude, while it's super important, it's very easy to be grateful or it's very easy to focus on joy and comfort, but then also let your mind wander. Right, uh, you're, you're, it's very easy to spread your your uh, creative capital uh, because there's no risk. Whereas if someone's got a hand on your throat, everything in your body is thinking, oh, survival mode, and, and all of your um, all of your attention becomes focused on the sensation. A hand on a throat, some of these BDSM things, not you know, not to say they're good or bad, but like a lot of women will experience, it really puts them in their body because their their survival brain is like, oh, here, this is important. So this is why. A lot of occult rituals deal with weird stuff again where, you know, it's not particularly pleasant because it's very easy to check out on joy. It's very easy to not take joy seriously because there's no threat. Whereas if you're perceiving something that's like scary or, or weird or uh, perverse, it kind of it kind of grabs all of your attention like a car crash. But you don't need to do that. I'm not, I'm certainly not saying anyone should go around, uh, you know, doing weird or painful things for the purpose of magic because there are other ways to experience this kind of focus. But it comes down to in order to, you know, if you think of your creative capital in terms of units, like your fucks, you gotta get, you can't give a fuck about a million things. I've talked about this in other episodes. Like if you give a fuck about a million things, that energy is just like kind of uh, dispersed. Uh, it's like you need for something, for you to move reality, you kind of have to get all of your fucks in a row, right? Um, and there's other ways to do that. Aside from terror, terror is one way. Uh, that would be more of like the black magic thing. There's a lot of things I could speak about that, but the thing that I've found to be most useful is uh, sustained sexual arousal. And you know, if you listen to this stuff, you know I, I have a course on arousal control. I swear to you, I'm not saying this just to plug my course, even though I like my course. This, the, actually, the reason why I have an arousal control course, especially for men, I feel like it's the most one of the the most simple and far-reaching lifestyle changes to learn how to cultivate sexual arousal because it just like enlivens your body. It takes advantage of nature's agenda. Like we go all the way back to our models of reality and like the animist thing, like nature is kind of indifferent to your to your needs. Um, but if you take on this animist or magician's model, it's like if you can align yourself with the forces of nature, you can get things done in a way. This is what... Um, scientific technology is done, like we can use the wind to power our sails or windmills, uh, you know, different forms of energy now, not by fighting against it, by going along with nature's forces. One of nature's primary forces that they are, that nature, if we personify nature, is not indifferent to, is the furthering of life and your sexual drive is, is that expressing through you. Um, so essentially we're, we're taking advantage of 
nature's drive that is already trying to express through you and using it for something. And, uh, you know, I'll say, I hope, I hope my girlfriend doesn't mind me saying this, but, uh, you know, one of, you know, she, she's a woman, she, she gets emotional about things. She gets emotional about things that don't really make sense to my male brain. Um, and, you know, something I've gotten much better at is instead of trying to use my male brain, my male material reality of looking at things in terms of minutes and meters and like, you know, well, here's the way to solve that problem is to forget that, is to take off and not bring the warrior into, into, into my relation with my woman. Instead, bringing the magician of recognizing women's needs typically are more in the energetic realm, the material realm. And essentially, this is all to say that the number one way that we solve her emotional problems is through sexuality. Uh, arousal, transmutes resistance better than anything else uh, and part of you know she's been well trained in, in these arts so i'm not saying that just because your wife is having a bad time just say hey let's have sex it's not going to fix everything but and, and what i will say is like on the on the on the male end the reason why arouse control is actually something that's been that's talked about in many different occult forms in in the tantra world tantra is really not just about sexuality sexuality is a relatively small part of tantra it's what the West tends to focus on. But the reason why sexuality is included in Tantra is they find ways to use sexual energy to better your life. Um, in Western occultism, even Aleister Crowley spoke about uh, men learning how to sustain high levels of arousal without release. And the thing is, the male body, when it ejaculates, the sensation drops. Um, so in order to have that flow, to have that drive still moving through you, the more arousal you can feel in your body, the more desire you can feel um, and sustain, the more you'll have that, that urge, that, that zest for life. I mean, I do find it's a, it's a major cure for apathy in men. If they can enter uh, pleasurable sexual experiences and not nut all the time, your body just maintains an aliveness. And the thing is, Arousal being such a primal experience, right? It, it occurs on like our lowest part of our nervous system, our most primitive part of our nervous system. It can kind of override other feelings. It's, it's very hard to be super horny and be frustrated about life at the same time. And actually, I don't know if I wrote down this quote, but um, oh yeah, yeah. Peter Carroll wrote in his book, uh, frustration is essentially balked lust. So is boredom, laziness, depression, and self-judgment. Essentially, in his worldview, this, this aligns with Wilhelm Reich's worldview that uh, any negative emotion we feel is essentially a lack of flow of our sexual energy, our life creating energy. And, you know, some people who are really into Taoism might not like this comparison, but I would equate that with Taoism as well in that like, there is a flow to the universe and in nature specifically, it goes in, in, uh, in animals specifically, it goes through sexual procreation. So this is all to say that, uh, heightening your arousal is one of the best ways to increase your desire, your zest for life. And if you've done the work to be truthful with yourself, to enter, uh, to reduce your mental chatter through the practice of gnosis, to laugh at things and view the world amorally, not that you're going to be a bad person, but like to not like go around passing moral judgments, which get you stuck in different narratives. If you can maintain that full view of nature, a view of reality, uh, and activate your body in this way, it gives you kind of like this fire to do things that is very, um, it's just basically a lack of resistance. This is not to say this is the only way to increase the floodgates of creativity, but is one that I find very um, far reaching in its benefits, especially for men. And uh, yeah, and, and if we actually go back to pre-monotheistic, uh, it actually it's just like kind of a factoid, I think it's interesting, like the word fetish, which we commonly associate with like um, sexual proclivities, like a foot fetish or like a whatever fetish. The word fetish actually refers to an idol. A fetish is an idol that, um, uh, that, non, that, that pagan people assign magical abilities to, right? Uh, they, they, and this is actually one of the reasons why in, in, um, in monotheistic religions, they're very anti-idol worship because it's very hard. It was very hard for you know, uh, the creators of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam to get people to believe in their God when everyone believed that their golden calf had some sort of power over them. So that's why idol worship is very um, shunned in monotheistic religions. But what a lot of people 
got pre-monotheistic people got from idol worship, from fetishes, is that they assign a bunch of meaning to a golden calf or to a rock with eyes on it or something. They believe that it gave them superpowers. They, uh, they focused their attention on it so that they got an effect from it and it actually gave them an effect. And, uh, you know, this word has become used to, you know, a guy who has an unusual uh, attachment to feet gets a lot of energy out of it for some reason. Actually, I'm not actually sure if that's the reason, the connection of those two words, but um, I just thought the, the word, the, the meanings of words were interesting. I'm going to end this episode uh, with a spiritual view. Um, I hope that all of this was, was uh, useful in terms of creativity, at least. And just to recap, understanding the reality that the magician archetype is what weaves narratives by assigning meanings to things. Uh, a an unencumbered magician accesses the fool archetype of seeing the amoral view of things, seeing the reality beneath the storytelling reality so that you can rewrite uh, certain meanings. And finally, if you can take away these blocks, you know, you take away these judgments, take away lying to yourself, take away resentment, um, enter a state of amoral laughter at things where you have choice of what realities you enter. One way, not the only way, but one way to really open the floodgates is to increase uh, the sensation in your body. And I think arousal control is one of those ways. Uh, you know, even Robert Anton Wilson speaks about this in, in most of his books that, in his lens, the way to activate uh, the circuit, the fifth circuit of consciousness. If you, if you caught the episode of Prometheus Rising, I spoke about the first four, epi- the first four layers of consciousness, uh, which are basically tied to well-known parts of our nervous system. The fifth is kind of a transition between science and mysticism where like you, you, you give yourself a kind of a mystical experience. It's, the fifth circuit is known as the Tantra circuit because it, uh, it act, you, you're activating your body to a level where reality can, can be changed, where you're uh, heightening your arousal to a degree that, uh, that contraction isn't possible, right? Like your body is so open, it's so alive with life that you, you can't possibly get worried about a bill that's due um, or like be, or be stuck on negative thoughts like oh I can't have this because it's unlikely like you know you're entering a realm of possibility and I would add to this a belief that I've found to be useful even though I can't prove <clears throat> is that uh, if you take on the belief that even these unlikely things are possible even these very um, unlikely permutations of reality are possible and you look for meanings you look for meanings like you're actively trying to write a story you're looking for meanings that make sense from one to the other it becomes more and more likely that you find future meanings that make your story make sense and bring you to that desired outcome as long as you don't take it too seriously uh, and you don't get attached to outcome i can't prove that's true but i believe it to be true and i do you know whether it's self-fulfilling self-fulfilling prophecy or not the more you look for synchronicities, the more you find synchronicities. And uh, life just feels more enchanting that way. And you can decide how, va- how much that is of value to you or not. <clears throat> I'll end with this. I know this has been a far out episode, uh, very different than our other three uh, Gillette and Moore episodes. <clears throat> it's actually a, a bit from my favorite novel, uh, Shantaram, by Gregory David Roberts. It's a book I've mentioned in different ways. I think it, it exhibits a lot of the principles of masculinity, and it's like one of the best, it's just one of the best books. It's based on a true story. This guy, um, <clears throat> he was called the Gentleman Bandit because uh, his real guy in Australia, he would rob banks, but he'd be super polite with people because he was a nice guy. He was also a badass. He broke himself out of jail. This happened in real life. He broke himself out of jail, smuggled himself to India, and ended up joining the Bombay Mafia. <clears throat> Shantaram is basically a kind of fictionalized retelling of the story. But one of his mentor figures, uh, which was the Bombay mafia boss, Khadr Bai, was also a philosopher. He was very much the mentor in the story. And he shared um, an answer to how do you determine good and evil and what is God, essentially. And he said, I'm, I'm retelling this, but he said that uh, from the Big Bang, which is the moment of ultimate simplicity in the universe, as our current scientists can perceive, you know, there was nothing, and then there was a lot of things. From then until now, the universe has become more and more complex, right? 
even though the second law of thermodynamics states that entropy is always increasing in total, there's also been a reduction in entropy, neg entropy, or a creation of information of uh, less likely permutations of reality in the form of planets, in the form of life forms, in the terms of, in form of life becoming more and more complex throughout evolution. We are far more complex and have our way lower entropy than an amoeba. You know, all amoeba are the same, but in our bodies we have you know, millions of cells that each are unique and are specific. Um, they're not random, they're low entropy. And if you look at existence in, in, uh, as, uh, in total, what Cotter Bai, the guy in this story, defines as, um, as God is this movement towards infinite complexity. And the, you know, the guy in the story, he was Muslim, his belief was that anything that brings you closer to God, anything that brings you closer to infinite complexity is good, and anything that hinders that is bad. Another way to look at this, this is, this is my interpretation, is that from the Big Bang until now, there have been infinite narratives, whether you look at it from a human perspective or not. Like, there's been infinite narratives. If you just look at humans, there's infinite, you know, so many people have been, so many people have been alive in life, right? <laughs> it's like a Louis C.K.'s thing, like, there's way more people that have been, that are dead than that are alive. I actually don't know if that's even true. Anyway, infinite stories, infinite narratives. Your job, if you do want to take on the spiritual lens that there is an infinite consciousness or collective unconscious or collective consciousness, however you want to put it, your job as a consciousness, as a piece of this infinite consciousness, is to maximize the complexity of your story. Not in terms of making things complicated, but, but in terms of fully fulfilling your per permutation of reality, of reducing the randomness, of not doing random things, but doing specific things, of having your intentions, whatever they are, whether they're for selfish motives or altruistic motives, whether they're for good or evil, I mean, under this worldview, there is no real morality other than moving towards and fully playing out all the stories. Your job is to fully reduce entropy in your part of reality and finding your specific style of finding your specific permutations and taking away randomness and expressing your intentions based on your desire to fully play out your story. That is your role as a consciousness in existence. And I can't prove that that's true. In fact, that's kind of a, that's kind of a should statement. So this is perhaps my view of morality, but I, I do find that this is a very liberating worldview if you entertain it. That's all I got to say on the mission archetype. I, I, uh, yeah, there's, there's many things to talk about here. So if you have any questions about this, I'm, oh, actually, all right, so a bit of an announcement. Um, I'm thinking about hosting some form of discussion group in my Masculine Underground Facebook group. Probably, we'd probably pick a topic. I mean, actually, the way it's, I'm conceptualizing it right now, putting this into form, perhaps, is we pick a topic and maybe speak about the four archetypes of Gillette and Moore. Uh, section by section. If you're interested in that, please join the Masculine Underground group on Facebook and I, I'll open up a thread or a poll um, asking about that and please comment if you're interested. If there's enough interest, I'll do that. It'll be free. It should be fun. And uh, that's my only announcement today. And if you are listening to the recording, if you're watching the recording, of course, I highly recommend you listen to the, the audio instead. Get off your screen. Do something in real life. Even though you're a magician, you can affect the world not sitting in front of a computer. All right, goodbye.